Brian Winters is the founder of the American Union, a union of swing voters joining forces to demand a better social contract. Inspired by his years in the New Hampshire legislature and studies of organizers such as Gandhi, King, and Chavez, the American Union offers 21st century political model for government of the people, by the people, for the people. In 2022, the American Union has taken up Dr. King's challenge to declare eternal opposition to poverty, racism, and militarism, and developed a blueprint for better America, a crowdsourced legislative package to end poverty with universal basic income end mass incarceration for major criminal justice reforms and end the endless war by reducing the military and reforming foreign policies that harm civilians around the world. In his free time, Brian enjoys 50 miles, walks, and studying history. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Marina Kufa, and my special guest today is uh, Brian Winters, who is the founder of American Union. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, since you are the founder of American Union, uh, can you give us a background? What is American Union? Sure. Um, so I used to be a state legislator in New Hampshire for a number of years and realized that the political system wasn't really working for the American people. And so the American Union is a different model for collaborative democracy in the 21st century. We are a union of swing voters because swing voters are the ones who have the most political power. And we have a crowdsourced legislative package uh, with a specific set of legislative demands, end poverty, end mass incarceration, and end the endless wars. And the deal for Congress is if they put it on the president's desk before the, the midterm elections, then they can earn our votes, Republicans, Democrats. We, we wanna see problems solved. We don't, we don't care who, who solves them. Um, and if they refuse, we can vote for their opponents. And as, by being swing voters, it just takes a small percentage to control the balance of power in Washington, giving us leverage over the political process and um, hopefully creating a, a way to, for Americans to rally around solutions um, and, and bring us together after the pandemic. So since when uh, are you working on this project? Uh, 2019 is when we started really drafting the legislative proposal and pitched it in 2020. Donald Trump uh, turned down our offer and lost re-election. And so now in 2022, um, we're offering this to Congress, uh, re-elect them if they put it on the president's desk before the election. I saw the blueprint uh, also. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the blueprint, for, the blueprint for a Better America is the legislative package. You can read it on the website. Uh, it's 207 pages long. Yes. And it contains um, about 50 different policies uh, that fall generally under those three categories of ending, uh, ending poverty, ending mass incarceration, and ending the endless wars. And by turning the model around, by being very specific about what exactly we expect Congress to do, um, we, can, we can change the model and expect results first and votes second, because letting politicians make promises when they're running for office um, hasn't really... <laughs> hasn't really worked as a model for the last That's few right. decades. And what is your take on the Ukrainian war uh, as of today? As of today, right? It keeps changing uh, pretty yeah. constantly. But no, I'm very opposed to, to war in general and, and um, would like to see it, it resolved. Um, I guess, if anything, I, I, I wish that there were more conflicts around the world that got the same amount of attention that Ukraine uh, is getting because mm -hmm. there is a lot of unnecessary suffering in the world yes, um, that's true. that that should be addressed. And yeah, we have a more wars going on right now. Um, Ukraine is one of them. If we can talk about relationship, um, continental relationships, uh, if you could develop any improvement, uh, what it will be? We should be trying to strengthen relationships with with all countries. Um, I think is what George Washington uh, advised us in his, his um, farewell address of, you know, entangling alliances with none, friendships with all. Um, so how should be the competition between the U.S. and China in the Middle East? In your um, opinion? 
in in my opinion, we shouldn't be competing, right? We should be trying to work together. Uh, you know, the way you, I, I guess the way that I hear that question is, is sort of like parents after a divorce fighting over, you know, who's going to control the kids. Mm -hmm. And instead you should be working together to try and, and produce the best outcome. So how can we, how could we work together with China or what can we do to help ensure that the Middle East, um, you know, is a, is a, a region with a long, long history and, and a deep, deep culture there. Um, how can we help make sure that they, they thrive in the 21st century um mm -hmm. that's that that's better than than competing and, and fighting over, over yes them. always teamwork is stronger right <laughs> yes. what is the most important challenge on the u.s security globally uh, you know we face a number of challenges uh climate change is one of them i think poverty is another one because poverty destabilizes a lot of a lot of countries and around the world and the united states our, our militarism uh, is also one of our our important challenges of how do we present ourselves as a how do we restore our, ourselves as a beacon of of justice and and good in the world where things like our drone attacks in in the Middle East you know we make small children fear sunny days because that's when the U.S. drones come out that can blow things up without any warning you know in Afghanistan right now after the United States uh, froze billions in, 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 of their assets. Now the Afghanistani people, many are selling their kidneys just to meet their basic needs. Like how yeah. can America be, well, there's a lot of opportunities for us to be uh, a, more, a more potent force for good in the world. You know, Martin Luther King called the, the US military the, the, the greatest purveyor of violence uh, in the world. And instead, a, a better. So that's a challenge. How do we how do we remold our reputation and become the, the greatest purveyor of good in the world instead? Yeah. So climate change. Um, how how do you think we can make it better? So uh, as you may know, the United States military is the largest single producer of greenhouse gases on the planet. We burn through oil, fossil fuels at a prodigious rate um, because of our global military empire. This legislative package, the Blueprint for a Better America, uh, will address this in a couple of ways. Uh, one, by putting a carbon fee uh, on, the, on the production of fossil fuels, so creating a financial incentive for us to pollute less. Um, also, by reducing the size of America's military, again, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we are, we're producing. Because these these larger global issues, again, they destabilize uh, large parts of the world when, you know, sea levels rise and, you know, things that people depend on for yeah. their, you know, when things that we've depended on for, for generations, when suddenly those patterns change. And the plastic, right? <laughs> One and, of the biggest issues is plastic. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the legislative package also includes a tax on plastic. Um, the United States, we produce five times as much plastic as our European counterparts. And only about 9% of it gets recycled. It gets, it sticks around forever and just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. They're finding microplastics in embryos' blood. Like it is so, we've, we're so polluting our planet and ourselves. And when we do recycle it, oftentimes um, it gets shipped over to Asia where people pick through and pick out the best and uh, burn the rest. And so burn these plastics into the environment as well. Plastic is a huge problem. Um, that we attempt to address in our legislative package. Um, what about the gas prices? They keep rising. <laughs> <laughs> gas prices do keep rising. Um, although I guess so much of America was is sort of built uh, around cars and around cheap fuel and cheap transportation and, you know, this huge road infrastructure. Um, so we've kind of, we've encouraged that. And it's maybe it's time to rethink some of those things and let the price of gas more accurately reflect uh, the amount of harm that that pollution does to to our environment. And so the carbon fee that's included in the legislative package um, would would increase the price of gas a little bit with that money being collected and um, redistributed back to Americans through universal basic income. So you'd be you'd be so essentially you'd have a credit for, you know, the higher taxes mm -hmm. on, on, you know, your, your purchases up until a certain amount of prosperity. 
Well, there's not much uh, public transportation. People really don't have much choices. We are a very broad country. We're th you know three thousand miles wide, um, and public transportation. You know, there's buses and trains and things like that. But in in many parts of the country, there are no no adequate. Um, Actually, it's like Germany. You know, they have the fastest trains. Well, Japan has the fastest trains in the world, but uh, Germany they have fast trains. More public takes uh, uh, train routes or bus. Uh, um, they also have higher fuel prices there in, oh, yeah, in they Europe do, as yeah. well. So, so again, there's that that financial incentive to not um, not put gallons of gasoline into you know a two ton vehicle and and have it motor around um, to, to look for more efficient ways to transport people. Yeah, they'll definitely have more choices. In yes. your opinion, did U.S. benefit change in Arab world after the Arab Spring? I think the Arab Spring, um, you know, revitalized interest in in democracy versus dictatorships, and it uh, awakened people to the power that we have to to come together and and force political change. Um, you know, in in the United States, we saw things like the Occupy movement, uh, where people were inspired to come together and use social media in the 21st century to to demand that things change, to have a political system that worked for the people. Uh, instead of oppre oppressing them. And so, again, the American Union can build on that, that sort of infrastructure of coming together with a specific set of demands to demand political change in exchange for our votes. Okay, let's talk about China. Thank you. Sure. What is the most <laughs> obstacle <laughs> into the U.S. and China to expand relation? I think the biggest obstacle is politicians who try and who demonize um, China for the sake of political points. Um, we saw a little bit of this at, in 2020, um, where both, both uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump were sort of demonizing China. And instead of, instead, we should be talking about what are the ways that we, what can we work together on? What are the, what are the problems in our countries and in, in the world? Um, that need to be solved and addressed, and how do we how do we do that? And demonizing people doesn't does isn't productive, and yet so much in our politics because while it's not productive, it is profitable. And when people get angry, when people get fired up, then they're more likely to open their wallets and donate to the politician and their party. And so we need to change the incentive structure. We need to by not focusing on the money, not focusing on the the politicians or their political parties, but instead focusing on the policies. What are the things that we want done in the 21st century? Um, and that's, that's why the American Union puts policy over politicians. You touched on it a minute ago, Marino, where you said, you know, we can, we're stronger together when we, we work together. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, yes. And it's, it's very true. Um, we can do so much more by working together. And, you know, there's, there's, um, influences in in this country in the in this world that try and keep us divided so that we don't recognize how much power we have and um in conquer divide and rule is a very very old strategy it's painful uh, and i it's, think we can see it right now it's yeah, very painful that we can change that i, I hope for better america as a legislative package that uh, ends poverty ends mass incarceration and ends the endless wars uh, Dr. Martin Luther King identified the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism more than 50 years ago. And because they're interconnected, they're interrelated. And so we have the opportunity to, to come together and solve them or address them in one, one legislative package. Universal basic income is really an essential part of um, rebuilding our, our economy and America in the 21st century. Uh, so universal basic income is a, an unconditional uh, uh, cash grant that would go to all citizens. Um, and under our proposal would be $1,300 a month for adults, plus a third of that for kids, which would be enough to lift every American family up above the poverty line. Right now, we've got 40 million Americans that are living in poverty and another 100 million more that are struggling. You know, we're the, the richest, most prosperous nation in the world. And yet so many people are, are hurting. And so we have the ability to fix that. And um, that's what this legislative package would, would do with universal basic income. It would also include a public option for health insurance um, to make sure that people had, were able to maintain their health coverage when they changed jobs or they lost their job 
you know, as we saw at the start of the pandemic, millions and millions of people lost their jobs and lost insurance coverage through no fault of their own. And yes. so we can, we can do better. Um, ending mass incarceration is really, it's just a moral stain on our nation that we have 2 million Americans that wake up behind bars every single day. And we are not the most evil country in the world. Americans are good people, but something is wrong with our criminal justice system. And so this legislative package will address it through police reforms, prosecutorial reforms and prison reforms. And then ending the endless wars uh, includes rethinking some of our foreign policies that cause so much unnecessary suffering around the world, like the use of economic sanctions that harm, harm civilians that are essentially a collective punishment on an entire country. Like um, it, our legislative package also closed Guantanamo Bay military prison, where we have held men without charges for decades and it's hard for us to say that we're a, a nation that stands for liberty and justice for all when we allow that to continue. And last, it, this legislation would, um, would reduce our nuclear stockpile by 50% over five years, not to abolish nuclear weapons completely, but to say, look, no one wins with a nuclear war. And the United States and Russia have 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And so we're willing to take a step back. We're willing to lead by example and say the ideal world is one without nuclear weapons. Yeah, this is something that everybody are very afraid of right now, especially 70% of Americans. Yes. So, um, and last, um, would also repeals and sunsets the 2001, 2002 authorizations for military force that are still used to justify so much of our military operations across the Middle East today. And if Congress believes that we still should be involved in so many countries, Great, they can pass a new authorization for military force, but what was done after September 11th, more than 20 years ago, shouldn't be a blank check for our military adventures today. So that's those are the, the, the broad strokes of the, the legislative package. And by coming together as a union of swing voters all across the country, making this offer to candidates in all 469 federal races, one unified set of demands, we can change the political conversation and demand and poverty and mass incarceration and end the endless wars. And work together. <laughs> yes. How should the defense priority of the US most be in 2022? That's a the great question. And I think we need to we need to step back and, and look that the United States spends more on our military budget than the next 10, 11 countries combined. And so we should recognize the US military for for the purpose that it serves in our economy, that it is in, in many ways a jobs program, that it serves to spread money out with, with uh, jobs in every congressional district, uh, with things like our intercontinental ballistic missiles, silos out in the mid, you know, in the out west, that it serves a function of pushing money out into the into these rural economies that that need it. Um, and so universal basic income can fill that same, same niche in the economy by putting $300 a week into the hands of every American adult. We can revitalize these local communities. We can empower them to do productive things, creative things, instead of giving them money to right. feed the, the, the machinery of war. And so that is the, the defense priority should be to reevaluate our military and um, try and make it into a force for, for good. And the rest is in the blueprint. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yes. A lot of good stuff. Uh, yeah. I had a chance to look through really quick. Uh, but yeah, definitely. What is okay. the benefit of the U.S. and the new Middle East? As President Bush said, it should be a new Middle East. Do you remember that? So, I mean, President Bush got us into the Iraq War. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I got into politics um, back okay. in, in 2006. Because... It was the height of the Iraq war. And, you know, I was one of, of many, many Americans who recognized that we shouldn't be there, that it was, it, there were no weapons of mass destruction, that it was, um, it was a boondoggle. And so, you know, I campaigned for, for office and was elected in 2006 um, because there were so many, so many swing voters that came out and said, look, something has to change. The having the Republicans in charge isn't, isn't solving the problems, isn't addressing the issues um, that we want to see addressed. And so those swing voters swung things to the Democrats in 2008. 
Then they swung things back to the Republicans in 2016. Then they swung things back to the Democrats in 2020. And so we're just swinging back and forth, but we're not actually moving forward. We're just going from side to side. And so the American Union is a, a different political paradigm that will move us forward instead of just left and right. I served, I served three terms in the New Hampshire House uh, as, a, as a Democrat because you, you have to pick a party in order to win. Um, but you know, I'm raising, raising two kids and I'm very concerned about the country that they're, they're going to inherit and the world that they're going to grow up in. And the, the incentives for politicians are all wrong that they're, they're seeking money and power instead of solutions. And so there's a better way that we can turn democracy around in the 21st century, where we can, we can crowdsource functional government. We can come up with our own solutions. The same way that we've crowdsourced 6 million pages on Wikipedia. Nobody gets paid to do these things, but they, people have a human a desire and a drive to create, to create things, to build things and cooperate. And so we can crowdsource a few hundred pages of legislation as well that will address some of the, the, the core issues in America today. What, so I guess, can I ask you, just, what, what, what is most important to you, uh, ending poverty, ending mass incarceration, or ending the endless wars? Well, I think that we need more education that people can do better decisions. So now tell me how your policies can help us with that. Uh, universal basic income is, is definitely the way to help people make better decisions. Uh, you know, when people are in poverty, that it takes up mental bandwidth of trying to, you know, figure out where's your, where's your next, next meal going to come from? How are you going to put food on the table? How are you going to pay your rent? And so studies have found that people's IQ drops by as much as 13 points when they're under mm -hmm. economic stress. It has a lot of other costs in American society as well. It, it's a driver of crime, it leads to more incarceration leads to people you know needing more health care childhood development is very impacted by allowing millions and millions of children to live in poverty um it you know it impacts their it's really it's it's trauma that we are inflicting on on children by allowing this to exist and it's a policy choice that we can we can fix we don't we don't have to allow it to exist. You know, in, in order to go to college, you really have to have money or you have to take a loan. So it's a very yeah. difficult route to get an education. And those days, education, it's a must for, uh, you know, for survival. So the universal basic income is, you know, of, of $1,300 a month uh, is, is enough to cover community college for people who you know, want, to, want to use it that way. Um, they, can, they can certainly do that. You know, there's so much educational material that's available for free across the internet um, that you know people are seeking seeking education and find it. So when we say education, we're, what we really mean is is a degree, degree. is a piece of a piece of paper that says essentially that you managed. You know, you had enough resources to stick with this program for for four years um, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so, in a lot of ways, we see college degrees in the United States used as a proxy for class. That if you don't, if you don't come from a, if you don't have enough money, then you can't afford a college degree. And so it's a way to discriminate. It can be a way to discriminate against people um, without, without being so explicit about it. Um, and so, yeah, it comes back to the, the class, class differences and the poverty in this country driving so many, many problems. And by ending poverty with universal basic income will empower people to, to be their best selves and unlock their human potential. Uh, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, that you know people have their, their safety and their survival needs that need to be met first before yes. they can really start to you know, build strong relationships and, um, you know, and be, be more fulfilled in life. And so having, having the resources to meet our basic needs helps people meet those first two tiers and, um, and climb on up from there especially in the past two years, COVID is so much more expensive. The rent went up. Um, now we're talking about college kids who can barely afford college and, you know, the people trying to live five, six people together uh, so they can pay the rent and go to school at the same time. Um, a lot of changes. Yeah. But why did, why did rents go up? Like we, you know, our population exactly. didn't, didn't, didn't grow very much. We're still building new houses, not as many or as affordable as we can, but, but it's also a symptom of wealth inequality that when people have the people at the top of the economic ladder who have 
money to throw at houses and bid up the prices of them, then that those higher prices that they're <laughs> that they're paying for the houses then trickle down to the rest of us. And so universal basic income creates a trickle up economy that there would be a greater demand, um, a greater supply of affordable housing if you know, if people had a steady source of income. You know, I used to be a, a landlord and owned a multifamily home in, in oh, Manchester. Yeah. And yeah, and so what are the, you know, the concerns is if, if, if you're renting something at an affordable rate is what does the person have a stable source of income? And so by ensuring that everyone does have a stable source of income with universal basic income, um, then there's, it opens up new markets, um, I think. So it will also, because this is a national, is bring people up to the national poverty level. Um, California, New York, some of these places are very expensive to live in, but by, because it will be attached to you as an individual, you can move around the country. You can move to places that have lower cost of living, uh, where your $1,300 a month will, you know, will, will go further. And so as people move out of cities and expensive places, uh, that will also create, that will open up apartments and houses and things like that. Um, so that other people can move in and hopefully that would bring down the, the demand, the cost of rent as well. Credit in the United States. Um, other countries don't have something like credit score. No. We do and our life depends on a credit score. Um, it, this legislation doesn't affect the credit scoring system or anything directly. Um, but what I think what you're touching on, though, is is a larger economic issue of what is money? How does how does money get into the system? Um, people are have expressed concern about the national debt that, you know, there's 30, a 30 trillion dollar national debt. But the last time the, the, the U.S. debt was at zero was back in 1835. That's and it wasn't like, <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't like there was a guy with 30 trillion dollars just sitting around saying, I'm going to start loaning money to the United States. The money is in large part, it's made up. It is invented, and it was a policy choice to to create it as debt, um, so that we can have the privilege of paying hundreds of billions of dollars a year in interest. Then that's hundreds of billions of dollars that could be better spent elsewhere. So the way that the this legislative package uh, enacts universal basic income is through the U.S. Treasury, having the U.S. Treasury set up digital bank accounts for every American citizen, and issuing Treasury dollar bills a digital asset to everyone in the amount of $300 a week. And these would be 100% uh, exchangeable for federal reserve notes. You could go to the, go to the ATM and withdraw your treasury dollar bills as, as paper money and spend it anonymous, anonymously. You, can, you would have a debit card linked to your treasury account so you could spend it um, everywhere else. And as legal tender, they would be, you could use them to pay your taxes and everything else. But it, this legislation would create a public payment infrastructure so that you and I could send each other money across the country without any fees. Whereas right now, the banking system collects hundreds of billions of dollars and preys on, on poor people, especially with things like overdraft fees uh, yeah. and other, other things like that. So this legislation would change the way that the, the financial system works uh, in the United States and create a trickle up economy. We, we have to add more money to the economy as it grows. But right now we're adding it at the top. We're letting the people at the top of the economic ladder borrow it into existence. And they're using it to buy up, buy up houses and drive up the cost for all of the rest of us. So instead, a better way is to add the money at the bottom, issue every American an equal share through universal basic income and create a trickle up economy so that as the money circulates in all these, these rural communities and these impoverished inner city communities, that it will create prosperity. It will, you know, when people get universal basic income, we see in these pilots a lot of times that people start businesses, that when they know that if they fail, they will still have a cushion, uh, people are more willing to take risks. And um, so, yeah, so it will revitalize these communities when there's money circulating in them. It will grow our economy. It'll make America a more prosperous nation and a more just nation when we eliminate poverty. And, um, and really address, you know, as Dr. King, Dr. King was an advocate for guarantee, a guaranteed annual income in his life. 
because he recognized that the poor turned into purchasers uh, would be able to exert more influence over their lives. They'd be able to solve their own problems if they just had the resources to do it. And the, the welfare programs that we have now have a lot of bureaucratic red tape that say, you know, they start with the, the expectation that you don't deserve help and you have to prove it. Let's see your tax records. Let's see your bank accounts. What do you own? And then maybe we'll give you some money. You know, during, the, during 2020, Texas denied more than 90% of, of welfare claims, you know, and, and a lot of times because maybe people had made too much money in the previous year. And so means testing these programs, we allow, we allow 40 million people to fall through the holes in our safety net. And universal basic income will create a safety floor that no American can fall beneath and will give them an economic foundation to build a, a more prosperous life on. There's so many uh, vets and people with um, psychological issues. Um, how do you think we can get them off the street? And, um, Obviously, those are the people who cannot make a decision what they're going to do with the $300 because uh, mentally, you know, they're not stable. There's a lot of people they yeah. need a mental help. Yeah. So one of the issues that we have with um, services that, that try and reach out and, and help the homeless and other communities is just is a question of, of resources that they have to spend their time, you know, trying to track down grants or get people to, to donate money because the homeless people who are, you know, the receiving these services don't have any financial resources to contribute towards, um, towards solving these problems and addressing these things. And so I think you could pretty easily imagine, you know, group homes, dormitory style things where people can can come together for you know $100, $150 a week or something like that to cover room, board, things like that, that would make these sorts of things more financially sustainable um, as opposed to what they are now, which is in, in the, what they are now is insufficient to meet the needs of the country. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, what else is in your blueprint that is so amazing? Well, lo, so let me let me talk about how um, people can demonstrate that they want to work together around the country and around the world um, as a way of, of saying, look, we don't have to accept the status quo. We're willing to challenge it. Um, this was Dr. King's challenge in his Beyond Vietnam speech back in 1967. He said, our only hope today is to recapture the revolutionary spirit and to go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal opposition to poverty, racism, and militarism. And with that powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo. And so all across the country and around the world, people want to challenge the status quo, but how do we, how do we opt in? How do we say that you know, we're willing to do something in our own lives besides just you know, clicking a button on Facebook or, or Twitter or something like that? Mm -hmm. And so the American Union observes a, a monthly fast on the 15th of each month, a group fast. Uh, this is in the, the Gandhian tradition uh, you know, Gandhi used group fasts in India to unite Hindus yeah. and Muslims that the British very carefully kept it divided and pitted against each other so they wouldn't challenge British rule. Um, so Gandhi used national days of fasting and America's, uh, the founding fathers used national days of fasting as well to bring people together because there's an aspect of a, a shared self-sacrifice and shared self-sacrifices are the kinds of things that bring communities together. Um, when and so fasting is is free the fast for peace is 24 hours without food you just drink water and it's whatever 24 hours works for you um, Gandhi recommended a dinner to dinner fast and so around the country uh, people start the fast on the, the evening of the 14th and go for till the evening of the 15th and we can sh we share this message on social media with the hashtag fast for peace which is lowercase by intention and say, look, we, we are willing to sacrifice to make this country better. Um, you know, we're not, we're not asking for universal basic income because we're greedy that, you know, we're trying to get something for ourselves, but to really address these problems in our country that are, that are causing so much unnecessary suffering. And so we give up food once a month uh, as a sign of sincerity and a commitment. And this is, this is a fast of moral pressure to inspire Americans to come together and work together around solving these problems and to inspire Congress to act, to put this legislation on the president's desk before the midterm elections. And they'll be the most transformational Congress 
in generations for ending poverty, ending mass incarceration, and ending the endless wars. And um, thanks to the, the magic of social media, this is something people around the, the world can participate in as well, can observe their own fast okay. and, um, and share that hashtag. We're going to save the food for one day. <laughs> right. And so we also ask people to donate the money that they saved on food to, to help others. Um, so donate okay. the cherry into other or other causes. Are you connected with specific causes that they can donate it to or uh, is just their choice that day? Um, we, we try and choose a different one each month and, um, and direct it. And so people get to nominate uh, charities and causes and then we select one each month. Very nice. Very good. Yeah, well, it's a way that everybody can participate. Everybody, reckon, everybody knows what it's like to feel hungry. Um, and as someone who's, who's fasted uh, many times, uh, it takes an intention. Mm -hmm. You have to willingly give something up. And this legislative package contains compromise. People have to, and fasting and compromise are, are two sides of the same coin. They're willingly, willingly giving something up. And so the people who are willing to give up food for 24 hours demonstrate they're also willing to compromise, not on, on the principles, but on the, the particulars in this legislative package to, to move us forward. So it's like the movement pay forward, something yeah. similar, right? Yeah. Um, and again, Which is and so people, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have incarcerated Americans who participate in a number of states. Um, so behind, behind bars, we can fast in solidarity with them to, you know, so that they know they're not, they're not forgotten that mm -hmm. you know, we're, we Americans, humans, we're all in this together. And if we want to work together, if we want to solve these things, we can, we don't have to be divided. Uh, we can refuse to play that game. Yeah, we yeah. need, so the system is broken. Like the, the Republicans and Democrats are failing the American people. We need a different way and a better way. And you, you, you seem like you get the idea of working together. Um, is the is the way to move forward why do we have two parties from the first place right there should be one <laughs> well so it's one sort of the, it's sort of the way that american democracy is set up so there's always a party in charge and a party not in charge and so it it alternates between those two things um but in the 20 but the reason that we have political parties was because when the framers wrote the constitution all they could do was send people to go sit in one room in washington dc and hash things out and, and write legislation but in the 21st century, we don't have that, that limitation. We can communicate and collaborate all across the internet, across the country in real time. We can represent ourselves. We don't need political parties to do it for us anymore. And so um, I guess tying it back to what you'd asked earlier about the Arab Spring, um, that, that same sort of energy of, of social media, bringing the average person together and empowering them um, towards political change. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, what do you What do you think? Uh, us on here in America, w w what is it that we could learn from Middle East? Fasting, fasting is a as as a one great example. In Middle East, this is where they uh, practice fasting. Well, you make a great point about fasting that uh, you know all the world's major religions have incorporated it um, because the the social contracts that we opt into that we, we choose to participate in. Those are our, our strongest, strongest bonds. And, you know, as you know, a billion Muslims uh, fast together for Ramadan uh, each year as a way of, of asserting their, their collectiveness all across the world. But uh, yeah, I think there's many other things that we can learn from, from the I Middle East. I think we should learn to cook from them. They have a great food. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah. sure there's something else. Yeah, I think you, you see a lot of multiculturalism in 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 the Middle East and um, in large large parts of the world. Where I think it's that, beautiful. Absolutely, you know, this is where I'm here. <laughs> absolutely, you know we've all we've all got our own perspectives, um, and so by sharing our perspectives with others and listening to theirs, you know we can we can gain a a wider appreciation of the truth of of the world, and and learn and grow. Um, so where we can find you. And so I encourage people to visit the website, anamericanunion.com, where they can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, they can read the legislative package and see all the 50 different policies that are in it and make a donation to our PAC. Um, as a super PAC, none of that money will ever go to any politician or candidate. It will only go to grow the American Union 
and bring people together around solutions. Republicans, Democrats, independents, libertarians, greens, everybody who uh, everybody gets has things that they like in this legislative package and um, nobody gets everything they want in the, the same way that the when the framers wrote the constitution they all had to compromise um, to to get it together but they recognized that america was worth saving that america was worth fixing and so they were willing to do that and we can do the same thing in 2022. and then we can also find you on social media i saw here um yeah That's you can true. find uh at an american union on twitter and instagram and um on reddit our american union well i wish you all the best with okay. the blueprint that you know it's going to go through so good luck with everything thank, thank you, you so Maria. much for your time yeah uh, thank you so much I, I really appreciate your time as well and um thank you for watching until next time Stay safe.